We're going to pray for you, Kate. Thank you. Father, we pray that as Kate opens up your word now, by your spirit, you would gift her with your truth and your insight that through her lips we would hear you speak. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. You want me to put that on as well? Mm-hmm. Okay, wow. I'm wired up all over. It's really good to be with you um, today. Um, I was here many years ago. Well, not that many years ago, because that doesn't sound right, does it? But um, I was here many years ago. It's changed a lot since I was here at college. Um, and it's good to be here and to see what God is doing in this place. And thank you, Roger, so much for inviting me to share some thoughts um, with this group of students. There is a story that is told about a man who wanted to change the world. So he did everything he could do to try to change the world. But he was unsuccessful. And he thought to himself, maybe I set my sights too high. I'll try and change my nation. So he worked hard and he tried to change his nation and he was unsuccessful. And he thought, maybe I set my sights too high. I'll try and change my region. And you know where the story is going. He worked hard. He tried to change his region, but he was unsuccessful. So he thought, okay, I'll try and change my family. And he did everything he knew to do to try to change his family. But he was unsuccessful. So he decided to try and change himself. And the strangest thing began to happen as he began to change himself. His family began to change. And as his family began to change, where he lived began to change. And as his region changed... His nation changed. And as his nation changed, the world changed. We all want to make a difference. But sometimes we begin in the wrong place. Roger said that one of the areas that I focus in is leadership and leadership development. And one of the things I know from my activity with leaders is that oftentimes we are faced at particular points in our leadership growth with the challenge of how we're going to grow and develop as leaders. And how we choose to grow determines what kind of leader we become and whether we effectively fulfill God's purpose for our lives. God isn't just concerned with the development of great churches and powerful ministries. God is raising a people who have a larger vision to transform communities and society at every single level and across every sphere and sector. God does not entrust these tasks to just anyone. There are growing pains that leaders feel on their journey as they develop. And each one of you is destined to influence the lives of others. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here in this place. So what I want to do is take us through a a brief reflection on the life of Moses that will help us to reflect on our own growing pains in ministry and reach for everything that God has for us. Moses is a good example because in Moses we find a man with a heart for God, a humble man. It's written of Moses that he was the meekest man on earth, a friend of God, even if he was the one who said that. 
But Moses didn't emerge from the womb with these credentials. These were worked into his character through an inner journey and an outer journey that resulted in him becoming one of the greatest leaders of all time. Moses had to face three overlapping cycles of internal scrutiny, or what I've called growing pains. Three major hurdles, hurdles that I believe we all face in our leadership journey, regardless of our gender or ethnicity or our culture or the generation to which we belong. These hurdles, I guarantee you, will emerge on your leadership horizon at some time or other. What is clear about these challenges is that they are frequently pain barriers in our development. They don't necessarily follow one another in that sort of linear pathway. They often overlap and they're cycles sometimes that we go through time and time again when we hit new levels of challenge. But if we're serious about serving Jesus, and not just ourselves, we will eventually come face to face with each one of these. Just like us, Moses was called to lead. Just like us, he wanted to honor God with his life. And just like us, he failed from time to time. If you want to honor God with your life, if you want to grow in your leadership, God will challenge you as he did with Moses to master three major hurdles that every leader will face. The first hurdle is this, what you know about yourself that no one else knows. The second hurdle is what others may know about you that you don't know. And the third hurdle is what you and others may not know about you. But God knows. And if you want to know, you have to go to him to find out. What Moses knew about himself that no one else knew almost prevented him from getting seriously started on the road of his leadership. I'm going to read um, parts of Exodus 3, 117. Just listen through. I love the scripture, so I'm going to read chunks of it. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them. Just pause there. One of the things that we have to understand about God is that his timing is frequently different to ours. Israel has been in bondage for 400 years. We're not told why God didn't act sooner, but we know that it was this particular day, not the day before and not the day after, that God chose to speak into the situation. God has his own timing. We're not invited to understand. We're simply told. But we're also told that God hears everything. There is no prayer that is wasted. I've heard them crying out. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Ites, 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 Ites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. And I just love that. God says, I've come down to rescue them. So Moses, off you go. Because God works through women and men. And when God tells you that he's going to do something in your workplace or community or city or town... Don't be surprised if you get a tap on the shoulder. He says to Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I'll be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you 
have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what was done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites and the otherites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 4, verse 1. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? And then verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. And here we discover the greatest challenge that any leader will face. That the challenge of leading others emerges from the challenge of leading ourselves. Some of you may recognize yourselves in this stage of Moses' development. Here I am, Lord. Why not send somebody else? Moses had a problem. There were things that he knew about himself that possibly nobody else in the whole world knew. These things posed a real threat to his ability to lead others well. And most of these issues were rooted in his identity. At some time, I encourage you, read the full story, Exodus through to Deuteronomy. Read it in one sitting. It's amazing what you see. But for now, just let me summarize some parts of it. Moses is a Hebrew boy, he's raised by an Egyptian family, but not just any Egyptian family, he's raised by Pharaoh's family. A family who sanctioned, or the Pharaoh who sanctioned the genocide of all male Hebrews of his age. A family that viewed his people as inferior to themselves. In other words, he lived with a people who despised what he stood for and who felt superior to him and his people. According to Exodus 2.11, Moses knew his own people. He knew who they were and he'd often go out to watch them work. And he hated the Egyptians and longed to belong to the Hebrews so much that one day when he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, we're told that in an act of premeditation, he looks this way, he looks that way. And then he takes the Egyptian's life. He kills him. And he thinks he's done a good thing until the very next day he sees two Hebrews fighting together. And he tries to break up the fight. And one of the men says to him, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptians? Suddenly he realizes his own people don't embrace him. And interestingly, once Pharaoh gets wind of the situation, we begin to realize that there's very little love that's lost between them. Because we're told that when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. No talk of, well, you belong to the royal household, I'll smooth it over, it was only a slave driver. So we meet Moses caught in a cycle of rejection. He's rejected by those who raised him, rejected by those he belonged to. And we meet him struggling with his own need to belong. Struggling with his own hurt and resentment. And like so many of us, Moses got stuck at that point. There are things we know about ourselves that may hinder us from responding to our true calling 
in every season of leadership and ministry, we're faced with those things. Stuff that's still working. The issues differ for each one of us depending on history, our experiences, our gender, our ethnicity. Whatever the case, there are issues that we recognize in ourselves that we ignore our peril. Moses was a shepherd. He'd been tending his father's sheep at the point we meet him in the story. Perhaps that was all he ever wanted to do. But God interrupted him in this cozy little moment of life. And challenged him to renew his mind about his leadership and his calling. Moses was good at leading sheep, but now God was asking him to lead people. And in time, he'd have to lead a nation. But Moses was stuck in a pit. He'd been out of Egypt for 40 years and he still hadn't resolved his hurts and his pains. He had got married, he'd had a child, he'd taken on a new identity, he had a new job in another land, but he still hadn't dealt with the stuff that he knew about himself. It doesn't matter what credentials you leave with from this college. It doesn't matter what you have in front of your name or after your name. If you don't deal with the issues that you know about, they will prevent you from making progress, from going forward in your leadership. You will get stuck. If you're going to rescue anybody or anything or help anybody or anything or release anybody or anything, you have to deal with the things you know about you. The jealousies, the resentment, the anger, the frustrations. Like all good fairy stories, once upon a time in Exodus 1, Moses thought he knew exactly who he was. He believed that he was a true Hebrew and that he could save his people all by himself. So their rejection of him nearly crushed them. By Exodus 2, he didn't believe there was anything useful he could do in the entire world except keep sheep. You could almost hear him saying when God says, my people, well, why, why have you come to my door? Yet God challenged him 40 years later to face up, to stop running away from what he knew about himself and to deal with it. In ministry, we're trained to concentrate on dealing with the sins and weaknesses of others, to help others. So it's easy sometimes to forget the issues we face in the mirror each day. If you want to get started at all in God's purposes in this season of your life, you'll have to face up to what you know about yourself. As Moses accepted God's assessment of him, he grew beyond this barrier in his leadership. He took up the challenge to push beyond himself and aligned himself with God's purposes. Are you dealing with what you know about yourself that perhaps no one else knows? And it's so easy for leaders to get busy being busy so they don't have to think about those things. Pause. Once you begin dealing with this, it's time to grow through the next barrier to your ministry and leadership. And at this barrier, you'll get challenged to deal with what someone else knows about you that you may not know. Let me summarize Moses' story. After the rejection, abandonment, resentment, murder, the escape, the despair, the acceptance of a new people and family, the reluctance, the fear, the staff, the snake, the plague of blood, frog... Gnats, flies, livestock, plague of hail, locusts of darkness, the death of Egypt's firstborn and Passover, the exodus, the consecration in the Red Sea after the song and dance, water from a rock, manna and quail, and the defeat of the Amalekites. The Moses who said in Exodus 6, 12, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? is a very different Moses to the man who declares in Exodus 14, 13, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. In fact, after doing everything that Moses never dreamed possible in his lifetime, he faces his next major barrier. We see it in Exodus 18, from verse 13. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? 
Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will whenever they have a dispute. It's brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times. But have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. And if you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain. And all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. When you're making progress as a leader, you will always reach a place where there are things that others will know about you that you will not know about yourself. Those things will be both positive and they'll be negative. If you are making progress as a leader, you will hear something like this. What is this you are doing? And if you are profoundly blessed and someone truly cares about your development as a leader, you will also hear the words, what you're doing is not good. It's interesting, isn't it, that Moses, in his lifetime, he went through a phase where he believed he was incapable of serving the people. And ended up in a phase where he believed that he alone could serve the people. In this society, we often view correction as a sign of failure. Let yet the scriptures express correction as a sign of growth. Hebrews 12, 6. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. In the Bible, criticism or correction is not necessarily a sign of failure or a disaster. It's not necessarily a personal attack. Correction may simply be a sign of growth. If you seldom hear the words, what is this you are doing? It may be that you're not doing anything worth talking about. It may be that you're too difficult to approach. It may be that you've not allowed people to care enough for you. To speak to you in that way. If you are too proud or arrogant to take correction or direction you will short circuit your development as a leader because there will always be things that others will know about you that you won't know because we are literally created with blind spots there are things we will never see God places us in community so that we develop as well-rounded individuals the real challenge in this story isn't that Moses delegated The real challenge in this story is that he took advice. And he took advice and acted on it from somebody who wasn't leading two million people through the wilderness. We need to hear from others. We need to be vulnerable enough to receive what others may need to tell us. What is this you are doing? Sometimes it's because what we're doing is so amazing and we don't know and we need to hear it reflected back. Sometimes it's because what we're doing is toxic to others and somebody needs to tell us. Another pastor friend of mine says that uh, people like this are like leaky barrels of gunpowder. They go around their work and ministry leaking a little trail behind them. And all they need is one bright spark to come along. At some point in our leadership development, we will need somebody, somebody to speak into our lives. Pray that God will give you a Jethro. Someone who will love you enough to tell you the truth about yourself. I'm greatly blessed, I have two mentors, I have a coach, I have peer leaders and mentors who have absolutely no trouble telling me the truth about myself. Sometimes I wish they did. Moses didn't realize that what he was doing was destructive. He thought he was helping. 
You're going to kill yourself, Jethro says, and the people if you carry on like this. Moses did everything his father-in-law told him. How we respond to correction is as important as recognizing that at some point we will need it. And very briefly, the third and final barrier. It's the greatest challenge because there are some things that neither you nor anyone else knows that, about you that God alone knows. We're told in Numbers 20, now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died with our, when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert? That we and our livestock should die here. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You'll bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. And he and Aaron listened, gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. When you read that text, it's tough. Now, I know there are Old Testament experts here. But it's tough. You read that and you think, my goodness, really? Small thing? And God does this big thing? Really? But it's only as you pause and step away from this text and take a longer, cooler look at Moses' life and character over a longer period you begin to see that there's a recurring pattern of activity in Moses' life, a major flaw in his personality that's left unresolved for years. Moses' relationship with God was remarkable. There was only one other thing that competed with it. It was his relationship with the people. Times he loved them more than he loved God. Times he feared them more than he feared God. Times Moses comes down from a mountain. He's been in God's presence. He's carrying two tablets, stone tablets, Carved by God. He comes down the mountain, he sees the people messing about, and he smashes the tablets. A danger in ministry and leadership is that your relationship with the people you lead and serve, with other Christians, with other Christian leaders, could take you to a place where you destroy what God has given to you because of what you see them doing when you've been in leadership for long enough you will understand what I mean leaders lead people but first we must learn to lead ourselves Moses started in his calling he progressed in his leadership But he never completed his assignment. Not every story in the Bible has a happy ending. If you want to grow in your ministry and leadership, God will challenge you to face three hurdles, growing pains. Deal with the things you know about yourself that no one else knows. Get started in leadership. Ask others to help you to deal with the things that they can see that you may not know. And take time in the presence of God to ask him to search your heart. Thank you, brother, for what you shared earlier. To search your heart. Lord, are there things that are so imperceptible to me and others that could trip me up? Complete the course that God has set before you.
Forgive me, I've gone over time. But I want us to pray. Can we stand? Lord, you've called each one of us. We're here by appointment. We recognize that, we understand that. We long to serve you. We long to see your purposes progressed. We long for you to work in us and through us. To extend and expand your kingdom rule throughout this earth. So Lord, we, help, we ask for your help to become the leaders we know we could be. To be effective in our ministry and leadership. Help us, oh God, to deal with the things we know. To bring those before you. To resolve them. Put into our lives men and women who will help us to deal with the things we don't see. Grant us humility to receive their challenge and their encouragement. And we pray, O oh God, grant us pauses and speak to us about those things nobody knows, we're not even aware of, but may be hindering your purposes in and through our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. God bless you.